All right, so it is um, now my honor, and you will be thrilled with this next conversation, this next presentation, which is our last presentation. Um, it's to introduce you to our closing plenary speaker, um, Adriana Hung. So she's a nephrologist and epidemiologist at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. She also uh, is a dialysis medical director, both for the outpatient and the inpatient programs at the Nashville VA. She obtained her medical degree from the uh, Universidad Central of Venezuela, completed her a residency at Albert Einstein, New York, her nephrology fellowship at UCSF, and her master's in public health at Vanderbilt. Um, her research centers on examining the role of genetic and environmental factors that contribute to chronic kidney disease progression and outcomes. Uh, specifically, she has studied many factors that are involved in this progression of CKD and is a major leader in the Million Veteran Program uh, Publication and Presentation Committee, which is another large data set that has uh, almost a million, well, not quite, almost a million individuals that have donated DNA. Importantly, as a nephrologist, I am especially excited about her presentation. So CKD is a global epidemic with undue burden on minoritized populations. So recent data show that a specific gene, APOL1, may partially explain that increased risk of progression in African Americans. This finding has now been translated to a pharmacologic therapy currently in the clinical trial pipeline, highlighting that both basic science discoveries or large genomic or health data can translate to novel therapies, really culminating our entire theme of this meeting of precision to population and population to precision. So please welcome Adriana Hung. Well, thank you so much, um, Sharon, for the introduction. Um, and thank you for the invitation to be here today, Sharon and Sarah, um, and the leadership uh, of the CTSI. Um, so as um, Sharon mentioned, I'm going to cover um, APL1 mediated kidney disease. Um, and as she well stated, this is one of the greatest examples that we have, I will say, in medicine and in genomics, where we have gone all the way from discovery uh, to clinical implementation and drug discovery. So it's a wonderful story. And within that context, I am going to devote uh, most of my talk, right, to um, a new variant, or relatively new, uh, something that we have worked on maybe on over the last few years, which is the APOL1 N264K, to which is renoprotective. And that variant, uh, as I will tell you, is very important because it has important implications for risk stratification and is really part of some of the uh, drug discoveries um, that have been made. And so just very briefly, I'll tell you a little bit about the epidemiology of APOL1-mediated kidney disease, also known as AMKD, for those of you that haven't really been involved in this part of uh, this story. Um, cover the concept of second heat hypothesis, maybe just briefly give you some examples of gene environment interactions. And for the part of gene gene interaction, again, I'll focus on the N264K. I'll make a point that patients with diabetes are also at risk of um, AMKD. And that's important because most of the studies and most of the trial have excluded patients with diabetes. So they are not protected against AMKD and they will benefit from treatment. Um, and then I'll try to um, close up with the implications that all of these have uh, for the need of genotyping, risk stratifying, and treatment. And because it's the end of the day, I will try my best to go fast and I hope I can accomplish that. And so um, APOL1 um, risk variants were first discovered in the context of HIV-associated nephropathy, which is better known as HIVAN. We don't see HIVAN anymore, uh, thanks God, but HIVAN is the most severe form, and people that suffer HIVAN went into end-stage renal disease in about six months. And it was a very specific form of glomerular disease, which is known as collapsing FSGS. 
um, a few years after uh, the group from Martin Pollock using fine mapping was able to define that this was a pole one and he described G1 and G2, which are the risk alleles. And so what was really important about discovering this uh, risk variant is that it really provided a risk, a risk stratification that allowed us to predict in African ancestry individuals who were at highest at the highest risk of progressing to end stage renal disease. And this particular um, these particular survival curves that you have here is from one of the landmark papers from Parsa and et al that use two of the main cohorts uh, in kidney uh, research. Uh, on the left, the African-American study of kidney disease. Um, and you can see there um, that there's about an 88% increase in the risk of kidney outcomes for those that had um, high-risk genotypes compared to those that have low-risk genotypes. Um, and on the right side, you have the chronic renal insufficiency cohort, which is a curve that I really like to show frequently because the European ancestry individuals were included in the comparison. And you can also observe that there is an excess, excess risk of uh, kidney outcomes, even in patients that have low risk APOIL1. And with that, I just like to highlight that there's some part of that risk that's not just APOIL1. It could be maybe social determinants of health. But also, I think there are other ancestry-specific alleles that, and, and there's about four that have been already recognized, that are important to study a little more to see if they can also help us to change the prognosis and the outcomes in these individuals. But in any event, what APOIL1 is, is a protein that plays a key role in the innate immune response. And what is known most for is its role in trypanolysis. So uh, defense mechanisms against human African trypanosomiasis or HAT, which is also known as sleeping sickness. And what you're seeing here in this slide is really a cartoon of the protein. You're seeing um, the different domains, which has actually named after their trypanolytic activity. The most important one is the SRA binding domain. Uh, because it's the one towards which uh, the parasite developed resistance. And it was through G1 and G2 that we were able to overcome that resistance. Uh, and so individuals with one copy were protected against sleeping sickness. Individuals with two copies, unfortunately, acquire the risk of kidney disease. And so how these variants became more frequent was through evolutionary genetics. Uh, they were selected for in the area of West Africa and Nigeria, where sleeping sickness was endemic. Um, and so what you're seeing here is a map of the worldwide frequency of these high-risk variants, G1, G1, G2, G2, and G1, G2. And so you can see that it's color-coded, and the purple uh, circle is high frequency. So you see it in West Africa and Nigeria, and in the area of Bantu in South Africa. Now, it came to America and Central America and South America uh, through slave trade. Unfortunately, West Africa was one of the areas that was uh, most affected by the slave trade. And so uh, because of that, then in America, we see a really high frequency of the risk alleles that's estimated to be between 12 to 14 percent. And I will say that this estimate is accurate and contemporary and national. And the reason why I tell you that is because um, from this biobank, which is a million veteran program, and actually the million veteran program is the biggest biobank in the world. So they started enrolling in 2011. As of last November, they had enrolled 1 million. They're now far above 1 million. Um, and they have enrolled from 80 VA centers across the nation. Okay. One of their themes from the very beginning was their, that their mission was to increase diversity in genetic research. This is key and important because they were really pioneers in this. Until then, most of the genetic biobanks were mostly Europeans. And it's because of their 
insistence in this concept that we were able to do the studies that I will share with you today. So at the moment that I did uh, this analysis, we were in what we call the release four. So we had 650,000 individuals with genetic data, and I already had 123,000 African ancestry individuals with genetic data, which is a lot, right? And so when I tried to see, well, how common is this, the bed variance from April 1, I did got that estimate that about 12.9% of that population had the high risk allele and 46% had one copy. Um, for us at the current time, uh, we think that one risk is not as important. However, having said that, there are circumstances that people with one risk have developed kidney consequences in, that is in extreme inflammatory conditions, mostly seen in COVID-19 or in um, HIV. So it's um, in general uh, terms, usually not, but you're not necessarily protected. Um, I also wanted to share with you that in individuals that are not of African ancestry or Hispanics, there's no um, high risk genotypes. And so this is the 647,000 individuals. And you can see here that in none of the Asians and in none of the Europeans, where it says NAN not applicable really, right? There's not even one with this high risk allele. So genetically speaking, this affects only individuals of recent African uh, ancestry. Uh, we also work with a, another biobank, which is known as BioBU. And BioBU has done whole genome sequencing in 29,683 individuals of African ancestry. And the results were very similar. 14% of BioBU African ancestry sample have a pole one high risk. The good part of this is that, thanks God, that not everybody with a high risk uh, genotype will develop kidney disease. And so that's only about 15%. And because of that, we handle the concept of a second heat hypothesis, thinking that there are environmental factors and genet other genetic factors that are interacting uh, with the APOL1 high risk genotype to bring up the kidney consequences. And I personally like this figure, which is uh, done or put together by Juan Carlos Velez in a review in a paper in Natural, uh, Nature Review Nephrology. Um, where he's showing um, the pathophysiology of the most severe form of, FS, of FSG, collapsing FSGS uh, of um, AMKD. And in these circumstances, um, what we see is that mostly viral illnesses like HIV or COVID, right, um, are really pro-inflammatories and involved in these more severe uh, manifestations. But I do have to say, uh, for those of you that are in medicine, uh, that we're seeing um, cases in people that are getting chemotherapy and immune therapies. Anything that gives you a cytokine storm can really generate um, this uh, collapsing FSGS form of AMKD. And what this is saying is that when you have a, a something that generates a big cytokine storm that will increase the gene expression of APOL1 in the part of the kidney that's known as the podocyte, and that will promote the differentiation and proliferation of those cells, and that will create this collapsing feature uh, in uh, the kidney that is uh, really of bad prognosis. But not everybody that gets AMKD get this collapsing form of FSGS. And really the most common is just hypertensive nephropathy. Uh, and a colleague of mine, uh, Kathleen Sastak, um, she did a study in mice where she showed that there is also an endothelial phenotype uh, that happens in AMKD. Um, and um, I collaborated with her and uh, demonstrated that APOL1 high-risk genotypes were associated with sepsis and uh, severe systemic inflammatory response, which is what she was working also on her mouse models. Um, this is important uh, because it can explain other scenarios where we maybe later uh, can use what we are learning uh, for personalized care. So during COVID-19, I also did this study uh, 
thinking in what Kathleen had described, um, in evaluating the risk of AKI, severe AKI or death in individuals with COVID-19, and I was able to see that there was a twofold increase in the risk of stages two and three AKI um, in individuals with high risk genotypes. And also there was a twofold uh, increase in the risk of dying. And this was true even in individuals with normal kidney function. So this wasn't confounded. This was not because individuals with high risk genotype already had kidney disease. And so what, why I think this is so important to, for personalized care, because if we knew what was happening with these individuals that had the high risk genotype, maybe we could have intervened early. What happened to many of these individuals is that they have something that we call partial recovery. So their kidney doesn't go back to normal and probably is because the APOL1 remains activated and they do have CKD progression. And so if we had known and understood this process, like I said, maybe we could have done maybe something earlier, uh, but a more relevant question is, is this something that we can extrapolate to other individuals in the ICU setting or in the hospital that have clinical conditions that are really inflammatory and get AKI? Do we need to genotype them? And now that the drugs are in the pipeline or in trials, well, hopefully we'll have those drugs soon and maybe these individuals should be genotype and should be treated early. We don't want them progressing to ESRD. Um, actually, AKI, AKI has uh, really severe consequences, including the one that I show you, which is death, right? And so that's important. And there are many examples of environmental um, uh, triggers. And uh, uh, this is from one of my mentees. She's looking at cell sensitivity. Cell sensitivity is something that also affects the African ancestry individuals in a much larger degree compared to other populations. Um, and through the innate immune response, there seems to be what you're seeing here on this figure. This is sodium dietary intake and the risk of kidney disease is actually mediated through cell sensitive hypertension. And this is a story that's evolving. We have to find the link this at the cellular level to feel confident of what we're seeing. And so um, maybe later I can tell you a little more on that part. Uh, but I'm gonna go ahead and move to the story of this protective variant, uh, the n 2 c 4 k which is now um, known as a genetic modifier for APOL1 nephropathy. And this, um, the discovery for this variant starts in a case report. Uh, and that was back in 2016. It was a patient from Ghana. He was a homozygous for G2, and he's supposed to, he was supposed to be protected against trypanosomiasis. However, he did suffer trypanosomiasis, uh, and they completed whole genome sequencing on these patients, and he was a homozygous for this variant, n 26 k which is an exonic missense variant that changes um, an amino acid in the APOL1 protein in position 264, which is uh, in the membrane addressing domain of the protein. But what's more really, what's more important is that that will basically make the protein uh, to lose the trypanolytic activity. So that's what they saw and they really, the researchers went and um, tried to find out what was going on. And so that's what you're seeing here on the right side. They're, um, testing G1, G2 on its own, or G1 and G2 uh, on a background of n 26 k and what uh, those different combinations, how they affect uh, the different trypanosomes growth. Uh, and I'm not gonna go into the different types of trypanosomes. I'm gonna tell you that this patient had the one that is in the yellow curve, okay? <laughs> and so G1, G2 has trypanolytic activity. You can see the curve that goes down. But then when you examine to what this patient really was like, which is G1 and G2 in the context of n 26 k the uh, trypanolytic activity was gone. And so that's how uh, the story start with this very particular variant. But um, several years later, um, a group in Boston, uh, Martin Pollack and David Freeman, they work with uh, cell systems. So these are engineer systems and they, we're looking at something that's very important. There is not a gene that works alone, right? Genes work in a 
haplotype background, there is a constellations of genes that are working together. And what we get to see is how all of them really network together, right? So this is a really important concept. And so perhaps they say that their uh, systems are engineered because they are, right? Um, they're manipulating the way that they mix uh, this gene gene interactions. But what they're testing is to see how G1 and G2, for example, will increase the cytotoxicity in these cells. And these cells are called hex cells, so human embryonic cells. Now, if you express the APOLA1 protein in G1 or with G2, but in the background of N264K, what they describe was that the cytotoxicity of G1 and G2 was gone. Okay, and really it's gone. Is that red line that I put there is like nullified, right? And, and that's just really relevant. And so we were just reviewing this literature and we're thinking, well, based on the patient, that's human data, right? And based on this in vitro study, it seems that that should be what we're gonna observe in humans. And because we had this very large population, we decided to test if n 6 for k uh, will modify the risk of CKD or ESRD in um, the patients from the million veteran program, right? And the opportunity to test us was really possible because we had 123,000 African ancestry individuals. And to 6 for k is not common. It only affects about 3% of the population. And so that's how we started this uh, particular study. Um, so the discovery cohort was MVP, as I mentioned. Our replication cohorts were BioVU uh, bio and all of us. The analysis was just a cross-sectional analysis. The outcomes were CKD and ESRD. Uh, the exposure was APOL1 high, high risk with or without n 6 for k uh, with these uh, sequ sequential logistic regressions from minimally adjusted to many levels of adjustments because reviewers uh, asked for many adjustments. They wanted to make sure that there wasn't any confounder showing the, uh, the um, influence in what we were seeing. Um, and we decided to do functional genomics. And the reason that we wanted to do the functional genomics is because we really wanted to understand what was the explanation behind what we were observing in genetic epidemiology analysis. Uh, and we also did a sensitivity analysis in uh, patients with diabetes. And so this is the, the patients that were in that study, um, nothing different than the typical veteran population, uh, mostly males, um, two thirds will have hypertension, one third has diabetes. But down here, when you look at the kidney outcomes, you can already see that in blue, for those that had the n 6 for k there was, for example, one case of FSGS for those that did not have n 6 for k there were 53 FSGS. And if you compare any of the kidney phenotypes, there are at least double in a high risk without n 6 for k compared to a high risk um, uh, with, with n 6 for k And so this is the results of our study. Um, in red, the red bars are patients with uh, high risk, no n 6 for k and the blue bars are with n 6 for k You can clearly see uh, that there is a significant drop in the kidney outcome. These kidney outcomes is the stages three or four CKD, and that odds ratios come to for about 0 0.3, 0 0.43, both in the discovery cohort and in the meta-analysis of the replication cohorts. Um, this is for ESRD, and it's very similar. The protective effect is even more pronounced. The odds ratio is 0.19 for the discovery cohort and 0.19 for the meta-analysis of the replication cohorts. So the, the, the value is so robust, right, that we did not doubt what we were seeing. Uh, this analysis here is a little more complex, and it was done because we wanted to have a formal um, uh, study of the interactions for these genes. And so our reference here is low risk, no n 6 for k um, I like this analysis a lot because the, the odds ratio values that we see, for example, here on the bottom for ESRD, 
when we compare individuals with high risk APOL1 and no intrinsic 4K uh, to the reference, it gives us an odds ratio 3.94. And that value is very similar to what we have gotten in nephrology in many studies. So it made you feel very comfortable, it made you feel like, okay, I'm seeing what I was supposed to be seeing, right? And it was the same thing for CKD, that odds ratio was 1.72. Yeah, the uh, Parsons all study had 1.88. So we felt very comfortable with what we were seeing, but there was something in that analysis that I want to highlight that I still don't understand, or we still don't understand, uh, is that the, uh, the risk, which is a blue arrow, uh, went below the uh, baseline risk. So somehow the, the group of individuals that have high risk with N264K ended up with a risk level that was below the ones with low risk. Um, APOL1 genotypes. And so when we brought that to a longitudinal follow-up, that was the case, and um, the group that is high-risk APOL1 with N264K is the purple curve. So we're still in a puzzle here trying to understand how that group uh, just goes below the baseline risk. But you remember the creek curve that I showed you at the beginning, that even the low risk patients already have an excess risk for kidney disease. So it's just trying to understand how um, these interactions are uh, working and it's complex and I'll show you in a minute why this may be so complex. But uh, this is the functional genomics and what you, we have here, A and B are pulse sites. The panel C is the hex cells, so that's um, human uh, embryonic kidney cells. Um, in the polar side is just a simple uh, um, study. Uh, the gray is G0, that's no risk. G1 and G2 are high risk. So G1 and G2 are in red and blue. Uh, G0, which is the low risk here, um, doesn't affect at all the viability of the polar side, but um, G1 and G2 will compromise the viability of the polar side. But if you express G1 and G2 with a background of N264K, the viability of the polar site is intact. Now here on the, on the hex cell on panel C, you first, you're seeing there is that when you express G2, uh, there is something that actually had been described by other investigators, which is that you open an ion channel on the cell membrane. There is a flux, in this case is calcium, and we're measuring that with fluorescent. Uh, if you express G2 in the background of an N264K, that's gone, okay? And that is the great finding of this very particular paper, is that N264K, uh, we call it a genetic inhibition, but that's just a fancy name, <laughs> but N264K introduced an, um, a change in the, in the APOL1 protein that makes the cytotoxicity of G1 and G2 make it go away, okay? And so, I wanted to highlight because many times people ask me, well, was the effect identical in G1 and G2? In the in vitro experiments, yes, okay? But do remember that the in vitro experiments are engineer systems, okay? And I'm, I'm, I'm gonna come back to that in a minute. Um, I do wanna mention at once that this has really important implications for uh, drug development and that some of the drugs that are out there are exactly doing what the N264K variant was doing. Now, going back to why did I highlight it that the other ones were engineered as a, a, unnatural haplotypes? It's because in humans, we don't see the N264K with G1. This is data from the study. Look at G1, G1 in pink, and everything is empty, okay? So N264K segregates only with G2. To the day, we don't understand why. Uh, the theory is that this is, again, evolutionary genetic making changes, um, actually back in Africa, uh, but it is difficult to understand what is driving the change because the, the trypanosomes have changed. The trypanosome Brusei rodian sensei has moved from the geographic area. The CC fly has changed. There are many factors changing, and so I think it's gonna require a lot of work to understand what is driving this evolutionary genetic again. Uh, but the thought is that it was caught 
just halfway through. Now, it is important to, to highlight, even when it's uh, present in only on G2, that it is common and important. Why do I say that? Because if I try to estimate in individuals with high-rich genotypes, which are the ones that I care about, how common will I see an N264K? If I think about a G1, G2, and a G2, G2, that will be in 6% of the cases. If I think about every high risk, that will be in 4% of the cases. Is that important? Absolutely. And why? And I'm going to just give you one simple example. If I was to donate my kidney to my loved one, and I was of African ancestry, um, I am going to adv be advised not to if I have a high risk genotype. But if I have an N264K, I'm safe. I can give that kidney without being worried that I'm going to get any consequence of it. And so this is very important. The French captured the concept really, really fast and run to do a study. And so in their case, they evaluated 80 potential donors and one had the N264K. And they made a comment that is very uncommon. But I'm going to tell you something. If you get one donor out of 80, that is a really great case. Okay, and so is it important? Very. We should be genotyping every donor, uh, not only for the APOL1 high risk, which I agree, but for the N264K, and that when we provide this information to the patients, it should be the full information, not halfway. And uh, there's been a lot of debates here in the United States about how do we handle this APOL1 high risk in kidney uh, donors. Uh, we're more open, so we want everything to be a chair decision making. We want the patient, the donor, to make a decision. Uh, the nephrologist will probably advise him not to donate the kidney, right? Uh, but as I said, when we give this advice, we want to provide the full information. So I am really advocating for a full genotype of patient of donors. Um, I want to share another study on N264K. This was done by um, Martin Pollock and uh, Simon Sanakirki in Colombia. They work in, for many years in this area. Um, and they study uh, the role of N264K against G2-associated FSGS. And I'm going to only bring your attention to what I put on this hot pink box, OK? Uh, you're going to see that the A allele is the protective allele from the N264K. If you look at the controls, they all have the protective allele. If you look at the cases in blue, none of them have a protective allele. So clear. Uh, for them, the odds ratio, the protective odds ratio was like zero. Okay, so fully protective. So this is an incredible report. Um, and some people now insist that these two papers together should be considered um, a really strong human genetic evidence that N264K does what we are seeing, right? Should be considered together enough to create guidelines. And they want to go further and create a classification system. This always happens in medicine. <laughs> we always have to create a classification system. And okay, well, that sounds good. So we should call, um, we should put an M1 to those that have N264K, which is a genet the first identified genetic modifier, and M0 to those that don't have the genetic modifier. Uh, it's funny because I think we're going to have an M2 and an M3 in the future. Uh, APOL1 has many exonic missense variants that alter the protein. And so we're studying many of them. We haven't discovered them. They have been studied by many other investigators. Uh, we are just testing them against important outcomes in a large human population. So we'll see what we observe. And we're not only doing kidneys, we're also going after other phenotypes that are common in people with kidney disease. Let's say uh, maybe your uh, vision, you know, there's many uh, overlap because the basement membrane is on the eyes, on the ear, on the kidney, and things uh, of that uh, along that line. And again, I said that it should be uh, tested for and reported, I learned that there is an issue, and that issue is that N264K in the clean bar classification is considered benign, and benign variants are not to be reported. So I had an issue with Natera, <laughs> that um, how can we do to change that? And the answer is that I have to report it to clean bar, and everybody that has done an N264K study has to report it to clean bar. 
Uh, but I think it's going to require more than that. I think it'll require the community to come together and go to the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics and tell them that we need to change this classification. One of the biggest problems is that there is not a protective role assignment. Okay, there's a risk factor role, there's a, a, a pathologic role, but there is not a protective uh, box on that. And so I think we have to really work on that one so that everybody, when they ask for their panel, they get the full information. Uh, I just wanted to highlight that, like I said at the beginning, patients with diabetes do suffer AMKD. The problem with them is because patients with diabetes have an elevated baseline risk, so they can get kidney disease not just because of N264K, but maybe because of poor glucose control and many other reasons. When you do the, uh, the statistical comparisons, your odds ratios will be lower, but it's not because they're not at risk. And so here, this table is showing the comparison for the NSTH kidney disease as an outcome. Uh, if you look at the uh, column for diabetes, you'll see that that odds ratio is 1.83 for people with high risk and no n 6 k and that when n 6 k is there, the risk is gone, okay? So, and through all the different models that were used, that was robust and consistent. So it tells you that in patients with diabetes, they should be included in studies and they should be considered for treatment. Uh-oh, okay. Uh, um, and yeah, I was just going to mention that this is a very exciting time because there are many different uh, drugs uh, that are, will come through, that are in trials or even in pipelines right now. Uh, here is an example of three of them. Uh, one of them actually it has a similar mechanism as the N264K. Uh, wanted also to highlight that there are other, other ancestry specific alleles that we will continue to study. Uh, in this Manhattan plot, there are many, but I highlighted the sickle cell trait. Uh, because in a study, I can see that independently of APOL1, uh, sickle cell trait uh, does um, increase the risk of CKD. And I am not sharing because of the time that we can actually capture this in the urine. Uh, this analysis also showed that the specific gravity is informative. I think what we have to do is really understand how can we use the specific gravity? And actually, we nephrologists need to learn how can we use the urine a little more to uh, inform the risk of kidney disease progression uh, in this population, but in um, the population in general. So I just wanted to make that point. Uh, and I think that's pretty much uh, um, what I wanted to share with you today. I think that all the studies of APOL1 high-risk genotype uh, and n 6 for k uh, have allowed uh, the opportunity to understand the mechanisms that, are, that explain their association with kidney disease and have allowed the opportunity to risk stratify, like the story I'm telling you about the kidney, the, for kidney donors um, and the development of drug therapies, okay? Um, we need to do genetic testing uh, in this context, I think we need to learn about doing genetic testing in other, in other circumstances too. I think this is a new kind of care and there is a lot to learn. Uh, the question that many people will ask is what will be the setting that we will genotype, right? And that's a really hard question. In the case of APOL1, all donors, but I will say that any individual that is young and is just with signs and symptoms that are telling you that's not fully normal, whether it is a blood pressure that's not well controlled, or maybe they're having some proteinuria, uh, or there is a GFR that is a little lower than expected, um, and particularly in anybody that is young. You should read that of family history, right? Um, there will be some family history here. So in all those circumstances, you should genotype. Uh, you may ask, what am I going to do with the genotype right now, right? And the answer is, well, for the time being, uh, just increase the level of care and monitoring. Uh, but hopefully in the near future, there will be a drug that will allow you to treat this issue, okay? Um, and yes, again, I do highlight again, genotyping the donors. 
uh, perhaps what I share with you today um, had implications for drug target development, any compound, any drug that blocks ion channel formation will be effective in protecting, either preventing or treating the development of AMKD. Um, and that's for the study that we did, and that's for that variant. Uh, do remember that there are other drugs in the market that may equally be as effective as a blocker. Uh, there is one that completely blocks APOL1 synthesis, an antisense nucleotide. Um, and uh, there is uh, another one that blocks inflammation. So there are several things on the uh, in trials that may turn out to be very promising. And yeah, well, thank you so much for your attention. This is my team. And the only important road is the second road, which are all junior individuals, um, junior physicians, right? And uh, I hope that they really stay in academic and continue doing some of the research they're currently doing. But with that, um, thank you so much for your attention. And then I take questions. Any questions at all? So just to let you know, currently here at IU, in our transplant center, we do actually genotype everyone. And in many of our CK, most of our CKD clinics, we did have a large trial of patients with hypertension in primary care. And just genotyping made the uh, patients and the physicians have tighter control of blood pressure, a major risk factor for CKD. So sometimes just knowing that will make people more effective. But we are only doing G1, G2 because we use the Natera kit. So um, now that opens up a whole nother uh, possibility. So thank you for that. Quick question, do you think there is still a gene environment effect? Because that's a pretty, pretty profound effect for your gene-gene interaction. Yes, you're saying that if you're, you're asking if N264K will block? No, 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 G1, G2, if there's still a gene environment role or you think it's all gene gene? Um, no, I think there is a gene environment um, interaction, and I think the most potent environmental interaction is your immune response. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and actually, I've seen now several cases uh, drug induced. Yeah. Because they're having like these big cytokine storms, and now when I get called, no, Adriana, look, the patient developed proteinuria all of a the sudden, then I always say, okay, let's genotype okay. it. <laughs> If you walk through our dialysis units, it's like 50 to 60% black. Um, so it, it versus 21% in the general populations. Uh, so it, it is a real prevalence issue. So Sarah? Yeah, my, my question actually sort of builds on that, which was around, it's a little dangerous for me to get up here and ask a question about this, but I'll, I'll give it a shot anyway. So for the gene environment interaction among your black population and the million veterans um, study, I'm not very familiar with the data set. Perhaps this isn't possible, but I was curious if you could get at um, sort of military induced trauma and whether you're seeing variation within those that have the genetic variant or the G2 um, component in terms of their expression? Yes. Um, that is an amazing question. Um, I'll confess that I'm right now writing a grant yesterday night, today, <laughs> <laughs> on that very particular topic. Uh, and it's an absolute great question. Uh, my, uh, I'm doing this with two other uh, copy eyes. Uh, and gosh, that they're going really deep. We have methylation data and methylation will capture, yeah, the environment. Uh, and so that's where, that's been my two-day work. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Great question. Mm -hmm. As you were mentioning the role of interferons potentially in stimulating this, I had to think, and as I understand, part of the phenotype of Down syndrome is because of the interferonopathy, because the interferon receptors are on the chromosome that's amplified. Uh, I'm wondering if the APOL, if, if Down syndrome patients with APOL1 would be at a really high risk of, uh, of uh, kidney problems. That is, I, I don't know the answer, but that is a great question. Um, because yes, interferon does it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Uh, any other questions? And Todd ran that, ran that trial, by the way, that I talked about. So thank you very much, Adriana. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I say thank you to you both. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, closing plenary, Dr. Hung, I think that you really brought together the precision, the population, back to precision <laughs> um, in your remarks. Uh, very thought-provoking. So as we wrap up our 16th year um, of our annual meeting, we want to close by of course, thanking all of those who have helped to make this possible. Um, specifically, many in this general area will call out our very own um, communications team led by Hannah Calkins, uh, our design team with Dustin Lynch and Jess West, our event manager, uh, Rachel Mandeville, of course, our amazing Gina Claxton, and our very amazing Julie Driscoll, who <laughs> yeah. um, and all of our staff and navigators across the state who have really um, put so much into the meeting planning and execution and throughout the day with your engagement. Um, we also want to thank our volunteers who have just been everywhere, checking people in, making sure that their experience was perfect. Um, you were our hands and feet today. Um, Lastly, we want to uh, uh, thank the Hein Hall team for hosting us so well. It went off without a hitch on our AV system this year. So appreciative. <laughs> it went so smoothly. Um, so we value your feedback. Um, please use the QR code on the screen here. Um, it's a very, very brief survey. Um, and you can give us what you liked, what you think we could do better. Oh. Um, this is the evaluation. All right, scan thank you. <laughs> yeah, get out your phones. Please scan. Okay. We will also email. We're back for the next. All right. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. Can't see. I can't see from this angle. There we go. No, no, one more. Right? Okay. That's. We will email you the, Q, the evaluation. Please be on the lookout. It will only take, what, 30 seconds? Not a lot of time. We value your feedback. OK. And we don't want this connection to end at the end of this meeting. Apparently, they, <laughs> it's OK. It's OK. We want to continue to connect and catalyze. In order to do that, if you haven't already, um, Please join our newsletter. Please contribute on our socials. And uh, there's the newsletter. I think the next one is the, I don't know. This is the feedback survey. OK. It's going to go far enough. All right. And then, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is my here, and he's up there. <laughs> okay. Sorry. Thank you all for being here today and for staying. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all.